These are the cheapest AIM-5 boards available from first tier manufacturers like Gigabyte or ASRock. You absolutely cannot get any lower in price if you want something from a known brand and not some cheap Chinese brand that you never heard of. But are they actually good? Can they handle something like Ryzen 5 7500F? Can we trust them to handle such load and not to blow up in the middle of work? Let's explore in this video. Trust me, you're gonna be surprised. Not surprisingly, all of these boards are based on A620 chipset that allows you to overclock RAM without any limitations, but doesn't allow you to overclock the CPU. Depending on where you are, most of the time all of these boards are sold around 70 to 80 US dollars. The Gigabyte board was on sale on AliExpress for 70 dollars during Christmas, and it was the cheapest board you can buy, even including Chinese no-name brands. Let's start with MSI. This is MSI Pro A620M-E, the only A620 motherboard from MSI. Gigabyte A620M H or S2H. Basically identical boards, the only difference is the VGA port that is present on the S2H. And ASRock A620M-HDV slash M.2. One interesting thing about this ASRock that there's a similar model that has a plus in the end. This one doesn't have a plus in the end, it has a lesser VRM and lesser everything else. The Plus model has a radiator and a much beefier VRM, so you should be careful when ordering such a board. The last one is ASUS Prime A620M-K. I didn't buy this one because, well, it's too expensive. It's not really an ultra-budget board. It is over 100 US dollars and you can get a much better board for this kind of money. But I'm still gonna mention it in the video from time to time. If you want something that has ASUS in the name that is like $30 more expensive but does the same thing, sure, go ahead and buy it. Maybe you're into ASUS and just not ready to buy anything else. Now let's talk about these boards. They're very similar, having basically the same design. They all have X16 slot 4.0 version for the graphics card, a single M.2 4.0, and an X1 3.0 slot for the expansion cards you might want to install. But not ASRock, because they decided to squeeze everything they could from the A620 chipset. With ASRock you get a M.2 Wi-Fi slot, a second X1 slot, and you even get a second M.2. But unfortunately, the second M.2 is only two lanes 3.0, and also it cuts down on SATA ports. You only get two SATA ports on this motherboard, while every other motherboard has four. Is it a good thing? Is up for you to decide. They all have the same ALC897 integrated sound, which is cheap integrated sound, really nothing else to say about it. You don't expect anything else on such a board. You might be asking, what Wi-Fi module should I get for such a board to populate this M.2 Wi-Fi? You should get Intel AX200 or AX210. Do not get the AX201 or 211. They will not work. You're also gonna need the antennas to plug in into that Wi-Fi module, and ASRock generously provided holes for these antennas in the backplate. You can route them here and plug them directly into the backplate. On the backplate, all of these boards are similar. MSI and ASUS put four USB 3 5 gigabit ports and two USB 2 ports. Gigabyte, for some reason, has only two 5 gigabit ports and four USB 2 ports. And ASRock provides two USB 2, two USB 5 gigabit, and a single Type C port. This is the only motherboard that has Type C anywhere, but it sacrifices two normal USB ports. And most importantly, only Gigabyte and ASRock has BIOS flashback buttons. They all call this button differently, but it allows you to update the BIOS to the latest version. And you don't even need the CPU or RAM, you only need to power up the board. If your motherboard comes with old BIOS version out of the box and your CPU doesn't run, you will be able to update the BIOS using this button. MSI board doesn't have it, they have easy debug LEDs which are also helpful, but I would still prefer the button, and ASUS has nothing. Ryzen 8000G just came out and all of these boards will probably arrive without the latest BIOS version to support them. On Gigabyte and ASRock using a flash drive with a prepared BIOS file you will be able to update them without any problems. On other boards you will need some external help. And ASRock has both button and debug LEDs. But there is something that ASRock doesn't have which everyone else does have. It's the RGB headers that are present on all boards but ASRock. 
MSI only has a single 12V 4-pin, ASUS and Gigabyte have both 12V and 5V 3 and 4 pins, and ASRock has nothing. I guess this is the way they cut down costs for this motherboard while providing everything else. Next is 4-pin fan headers, which is, well, it has an interesting situation. Gigabyte and MSI has three of those four pins, ASUS has only two, and ASRock has four four pins. Cheap Chinese no-name boards usually have troubles controlling three-pin fans. These boards can control three and four-pin fans, no problem, but ASRock can control three-pin fans on all headers but the one that is marked as CPU fan header. That one only allows to control 4 pins and 3 pin fans will work on 100%. Now let's discuss VRAM of these motherboards starting with MSI. It has 6 phases powering the CPU and it's really not that bad. The VRAM layout however will not allow you to install any kind of radiator even if you wanted to. Next is Gigabyte board that has 5 CPU phases which are also actually not that bad. The VRM layout does allow you to install a radiator but there are no mounting holes for it. But I guess I can glue it or something, I don't know, don't do that. Please don't glue your VRM radiator to this board, but I guess you could. Next is the ASRock board that has only 4 phases for the CPU and it's using 50 amp DRMOS which is well surprisingly good for such a price. Many of you would question what kind of results would we see on such a low phase VRM. Let's just say the result might quite surprise you. Next is ASUS, it has dual 4 phases, which is probably the best VRM of all boards presented on this review. It's not better by a whole lot, but it's definitely a step forward, probably its only advantage. Ryzen X and non-X CPUs have very different power limits. How much power they're gonna consume at maximum performance. 7500F would consume 88 watts and this 7700X would consume 142 watts. Let's look at the board specifications. What does manufacturers say about how much power they can provide to the CPUs? MSI has nothing on the front page, but if you go to support and go to CPU support, you will see that the board will power any CPU, but some CPUs may be limited in power because the board cannot provide this much. Gigabyte doesn't say anywhere anything about power limitations, and it also specifies all CPU in support page. So Gigabyte basically says everything should work. ASRock on the other hand just specifies right on the front page that it supports up to 65 watt CPUs. And you might be saying well that's not a lot, it won't be able to power even 7500F. And if you look at the CPU support list you can only see non-X CPUs up to 7900. You need to understand that it's 65 watt CPUs, not actual 65 watts of maximum power. So the CPUs in the list should run fine on this motherboard. ASUS also says on the main page that it can support up to 120 watt CPUs and if you go to the support page you can see that it supports all CPUs but the most power hungry 12 and 16 core X CPUs. All other CPUs are presented in the CPU support list. Let's start our VRM tests with Gigabyte. If you just put in 7500F and press the stress test and do nothing in BIOS the CPU consumes its maximum power limit to 88 watts. So the CPU is in no way power limited in this motherboard, it will run at full clock. The problem is the VRM temperature that is reaching more than 100 degrees after like 10 minutes of stress testing. You need to understand that it's not gonna cause any immediate harm to the board. It will be able to work in this condition for years and as you can see it's actual 105 degrees. But this is a bad condition test with basically no airflow. If we would introduce some airflow like from this very cheap fan that I got for two dollars at the nearest LA electronics store, the VRM temperatures drop to 85 degrees which is very reasonable. If you have a good case airflow or a huge CPU tower with dual fans, you'll probably be fine and it's not gonna reach 100 degrees. But if you have a stupid non-mesh case, you're gonna suffer. So get a good airflow case. Next we go to BIOS and try to unlock as much power from this motherboard as we can get. In order to do that, you go to AMD CBS and there you go to SMU common options. And and there you remove all possible power limits and temperature limits. Then I installed 7700X that can draw a lot of power and the board can provide up to 120 watts of 
power to the CPU. This is its absolute maximum and the VRM overheats almost immediately. So I don't recommend you do that because you don't really need to do that with 7500F. I recommend for such motherboard a good top flow cooler like these AMD coolers that come with CPUs or some decent tower cooler with dual fans. Cooling solutions like that will provide good VRM airflow and will allow it not to overheat itself to 100 degrees. Next is the MSI board and it has some, well, weird limitation out of the box. It will only allow the CPU to draw up to 85 watts, not more. It's very close to 88 watts that 7500F is drawing by default, but it's still a little weird. The VRM temps also reach 100 degrees for the MSI board with almost no airflow. You need to understand that these kind of temperatures would not kill the board immediately. It will probably work for a year or two or three, but still it's not great for the board. Applying some airflow with a cheap cooler also reduces the VRM temps by 20 degrees. Let's go remove all limitations just like we did on the Gigabyte board and see how much power we can squeeze out of this board with 7700X. Interestingly, this board does have PBO on the bias, but it does nothing, it just ignores it. And the maximum power this board can provide to the CPU is 110 watts, which is more than enough for 7500F or 7700 or even 7800X3D. These boards are perfectly capable of powering non-X up to 8 core CPUs. So for both MSI and Gigabyte, the only real problem is the VRM temperatures if you don't provide enough airflow. Next is ASRock and you're probably giggling thinking how bad this board is gonna do in the tests. So let's begin. This board has a weird temperature limitation out of the box. It doesn't allow CPU to reach more than 75 degrees and limits its power upon 75 degrees. In my case it was 75 watts of power and 75 degrees. So let's go to BIOS and remove this limitation and allow the CPU to run at maximum 95 degrees. And right after we do that we can see that 7500F will now draw full 88 watts like it's supposed to draw. So just like Gigabyte and MSI this board will power any non-X 8 core CPU like 7700 or 7800X3D or 7500F. And looking at the temperatures they're good. The VRM doesn't reach more than 85 degrees. Because the MOSFETs are very far away from each other, there's no temperature sensor on the board. And you might be wondering, why are the temperatures so low? It actually makes a lot of sense. Most of the heat is actually going into the PCB and is being dispersed by the PCB. The other part of the heat is dissipated by air, but because these MOSFETs are, well, physically not close to each other, it actually allows for more airflow. And the other great thing about this board that it has holes. Holes. You might say, well, my ex also had holes and it doesn't make her great. But you can easily install a radiator on this motherboard because of the holes. Find some piece of aluminum and a thermal pad and easily attach it to the board using these holes. Tie it with a rope, I guess, or something, but it's totally doable. But don't forget the thermal pad. No direct metal contact with the VRM. Now let's go remove all the power limitations from this motherboard and install 7700X to see how much we can draw. The process is the same as on all other motherboards. But in here, when installing 7700X, it actually says you that this CPU is not recommended and you need to press F1 to boot the board. And it will remind you of that on every start. And lifting the limitations did nothing. It still consumes 88 watts of power. So I guess Sasrock decided that no tinkering with power for us. But it's still enough. It's more than enough for 7800F or something like 7800X3D even. As for the ASUS, it does allow for very power hungry CPUs, but here's the problem. How do you plan to cool this VRM without any radiator? Other boards quickly reach 105 degrees when powering a power hungry 7700X. Will this board even be able to provide long term power to these power hungry CPUs? That is a good question that I do not have an answer for. If you're an owner of this board, please leave a comment. Now let's quickly discuss RAM overclocking on these mother 
motherboards. Because you can install only two DDR5 RAM sticks, these boards are great for DDR5 overclocking. You can definitely install a 6000 memory kit with XMP Expa and it would just work. And even great manual overclocking is possible. So don't worry about your RAM, it's good. Now if I would have to rate these boards, I would put Gigabyte and ASRock on the first place. Gigabyte is just overall very cheap and affordable and ASRock has basically everything you might want from such a cheap board. And both of these boards have BIOS flashback in order to update the BIOS. MSI takes a second place, it's a great overall board, it just doesn't have the bias flashback. Otherwise, a perfectly good board. And Asus it takes the third place, it's, it's too expensive, it's not an ultra budget board, I don't even know why I'm talking about this. It's not a bad board, it's just it's just too expensive. You get the same stuff for 20 to 30 dollars cheaper on other brands, so why would you buy this one? But if you can buy it on sale or maybe some discount, then go ahead, why not? Now, you might be asking yourself, what if I increase my budget and go for a better A620 motherboard? What would I get? Well, you would probably get a beefier VRM, maybe some M.2 radiator, more USB slots, maybe a Type-C on the front panel. You will probably be able to install any CPU with this kind of a beefy VRM with radiator. I installed a 7950X in this motherboard and it did work flawlessly. So you will be getting all the good stuff, but considering these boards are now worth like $100-$110, it's just better to buy this. This is the cheapest B650M board from ASRock you can buy. It's worth like $95 where I live. And it's basically a beefier version of this motherboard with better VRM and better M.2 with everything better. Price increase is like $20, at least where I live. So in my opinion, a better E620 is just not worth it. Get yourself a nice B650 board. Maybe wait for a discount or some kind of sale. So, should you buy these motherboards? I think yes, they allow you to build a very affordable Ryzen 7000 system. They're not bad, they will absolutely allow you to drive your 7500F to its full potential. Yeah, they only have one M.2 and USB port selection is limited, no Type-C for the front panel, but they are absolutely not bad, not bad at all. So if you're thinking to buy one of these boards to save a buck when building your Ryzen 7000 system, it's not a bad idea. I would still recommend you to maybe add like 20 to 30 dollars and go for a cheap B650 board. There is a catch though, there is a big catch for the cheap B650 boards. Gigabyte has this huge lineup of very affordable B650 boards that are not actually B650. None of the boards in the list allow CPU overclocking, only RAM. Nothing will work in terms of CPU overclocking. Not in BIOS, not in Ryzen Master. Do not buy these Gigabyte boards. Get an ASRock board, the one I showed earlier. It does have different problems, but it allows CPU overclocking with almost no limitations. As for these boards, if you want to get 700F, well, I guess you can buy them. There's really nothing bad about them. Thank you for watching, I hope you liked this video. Please subscribe, it really helps the channel. And see you in the next one.